Thank you so much for joining us. It's a real pleasure to talk to you. Uh, this this uh, summit is all about the intersection of sports and technology. And it occurred to me as I was walking over here this morning that we reserve a kind of unconditional love for our athletes here in San Francisco mm -hmm. that we, we don't always give to our technology executives and companies. Why is San Francisco right now so conflicted about the tech boom in its midst, do you think? Well, first of all, how can you compare the two? When you're watching sports on television and you're seeing these amazing athletes compete, uh, it's really exciting, especially when you're rooting for your teams. It actually brings people together. Tech is, is quite different. Well, double -edged. I, I think that sometimes there's a disconnect between um, the technology created and the people who create it. So yes, you know, the complicated relationship between uh, what's happening here in San Francisco and the tech industry um, has been quite challenging. And uh, because we're all on our smartphones, we can basically call a Uber or Lyft and uh, get outside and, and, and tweet a complaint about how tech might be ruining the city, but created by tech, right? And I think that there's a disconnect um, between uh, the industry and the people who are part of the industry and the people who are a part of the city, especially people who have been a part of the city for so many years. And so this industry um, came into San Francisco and, and pretty much took over, but not necessarily um, with a equity lens, not necessarily um, outreaching to uh, the neighborhoods, the communities, the schools, and trying to include the people who were already here. It was about bringing more people to San Francisco, and we created uh, this huge boom with over 60,000 new jobs um, between 2010 and 2015 for every eight jobs we created. We created one unit of housing, and then we weren't prepared uh, for what this might do to affordability, which in San Francisco is already really expensive. And so I just think that now we're reacting to uh, the challenges that have come our way. Um, but I think that we can work together to resolve a lot of those issues. And so I'm proposing, you know, a number of great things in the city to and do I just that. I want to ask about that. Um, I've lived here for 22 years. I grew up, though, in Cleveland, Ohio. And I have to say, the problems associated with businesses leaving your city are much worse uh, than the businesses being in your city and creating a lot of job growth. Um, but you know, when it comes to the problems that you inherited, the affordability crisis and homelessness, how do you, you know, enlist the tech companies here to be a part of the solution? I think because so many of the tech businesses um, do well financially, and we know that a lot of them have started here. I, I think we got to go back to some basics because when you think about companies that have origin in San Francisco, uh, like the Gap and, and other institutions, um, it's about giving back too. It's about financially contributing, it's about getting their employees actively engaged and being a part of solution. But it's also about hiring young people who live in San Francisco and to help young people climb in their companies. So I think that's one of the things that uh, we need to work uh, better on, on doing. And so I started a program called Opportunities for All, where we provide paid internships for all high school students and transitional age youth. That's young people between the ages of 18 and 24. We want young people in this city, no matter what neighborhood they live in, no matter their financial circumstances, to have access to this industry. So we've gotten a lot of financial contributions to pay for this program from tech, but the internship opportunities where you are working directly with young people and responsible for young people, that has been problematic uh, because it does require uh, giving of your time and, and really allowing a young person who's never had the opportunity to explore what you are doing to, to be exposed to it and for you to be a mentor and to teach them. And so that's something that, you know, really I've been pushing for uh, because I think that's really going to be an important part of changing the relationship. I, I imagine one challenge, though, is to make sure that there's a path for those interns 
inside the companies and not that it's a revolving door and they, they, they do the internship and then they, they leave? How do, you, how do you get the companies to really commit to the underserved uh, members of San Francisco? And, and it's about accountability. And there have been some companies that have done just that. And again, I mentioned you know, companies like The Gap and companies like Salesforce. Um, there are companies who have, you know, contributed and tried to allow, you know, an opportunity once the child or the young person is in college and, and, and to provide them with a job opportunity once they finish college. So there are some companies in San Francisco do, doing that, but there aren't enough. Who hasn't stepped up? Let's call them out. Uh, yeah, so, the, the, the Ubers, the Twitters, uh, how, are, how are they doing? Well, they have a lot more work to do. Um, I will just say that. And I think... Um, you know, it's possible, but we also um, had to provide them, we have to provide them with the infrastructure. So opportunities for all, we have an infrastructure because it can't just be a young person is showing up to your, your place of employment and you have to figure out what to do. Like some of the young folks that we are targeting are our kids who have never been in an office environment. I'm, I mean, I showed up the first day at age 14 at the family school. I wasn't necessarily dressed appropriately. I answered the phone inappropriately. I made, you know, I had an attitude back then at age 14. I mean, you know how teenagers are. And so there were some real challenges. And so the people who work with me could have just said, I don't want to be bothered because she is a handful. And instead, they helped to coach me and to help me to understand some of the basics of what is required to work in an office environment, which then led to helping me explore, you know, how to put together a letter and how to do all these things that you needed to do in an office environment. And I think, you know, what we try to do is through our orientations with people who are willing to work with young people, even if you decide it's just one person, I'll work with one person, you know, to help people understand the challenges that some of these young people face and how you really are becoming, like, like this is not just a one-time commitment. You have to make an investment in this young person's life. And we also have to provide the tools to um, help you through the process in case there might be issues. Um, so I, I think providing the right resources, working together, but getting a commitment saying, look, okay, well, we'll try it. We'll take a few young people and what do we need to do and committing to doing it and sticking with it, not just for the summer, but year round. Mayor Breed, our, our very active board of supervisors here have, have been suge suggesting some ideas as it relates to the tech community that could hit the ballot in the next few elections. One is 24-7 is mental health care, which of course I think we'd all agree that we, that we need here in the city, but one idea to pay for it is a tax, an extra tax on tech companies where there's a gap, a certain gap between CEO pay and employee pay. So I guess I'm wondering how you feel about that and also how we avoid sending a message to this tech community that, that they're not wanted here. So I think unfortunately, um, you know, it's, it's challenging because I can control what I do. I can't necessarily control what the Board of Supervisors does. To be does. clear, you've come out against those ideas, I believe. Um, I have not because we, we're just getting the details okay. around. I mean, and they're changing. So one, we want to make sure we have the facts before I make a decision. Um, but ultimately, you know, I will say that folks in the tech industry need to register and vote um, and need to become more politically engaged. That's one way um, to help make sure that we get good people elected to public office. And then secondly, um, I think that, yes, there is a need to pay more. There is a need to pay, you know, your fair share when it comes to being a part of such an amazing city. But there's a way to do it responsibly. Um, in fact, we are putting a, a tax on the ballot um, for transit network companies to provide a tax with the support of those companies, with contributions to help support this tax from Uber and Lyft. So from the rideshare companies and working with them, we came up with something that is a responsible tax to help provide support for our transportation and infrastructure in San Francisco, which we know that these cars play a role in, in the infrastructure and congestion and all of the other things. And, and so they, the companies need to pay their fair share in that regard. But we didn't just say, this is what you're going to do. We said, let's sit down and talk about a responsible way for you to do it. They love the idea in part because the riders will pay for it. But I have one, uh, one other uh, proposition question. 
Uh, there's one idea for an extra IPO tax. Mm -hmm. uh, how, do you, how do you feel about that? And, and again, I just think to say we're going to charge an IPO tax, we're going to charge a CEO tax, we're going to charge it without having bringing stakeholders to the table and having a comprehensive discussion, even if everyone walks out the room upset about the, 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 the outcome, we have to make sure that we're using data. We have to make sure that we are being collaborative and making sure that it can be implemented because there are also some concerns of implementation from the treasurer tax collector. There are some concerns about how it's going to, the unintended consequences of impacting not just tech, but what about formula retail, which provides employment opportunities for low and middle income residents in San Francisco? So we got to be careful when we try and put forward solutions uh, through taxes without having, you know, a real uh, data and a thought out plan and, and collaborative approach to addressing these issues. What did, uh, we're going to, I swear we'll move on, but what did you make of the recent uh, vote on e-cigarettes? I, I, I've heard it remarked that it will be safer and more legal to smoke cannabis than it will be to puff on a, a vape. So, so here, here's the thing. The, the problem I have is that the FDA has not produced any data to help us understand the health impacts of e-cigarettes. We're hearing from the companies that this helps people get off cigarettes, this helps, you know, basically it's a lot uh, less toxic than cigarettes. I, I, don't, I don't take the company's word for it, the research that the companies paid for as a way to determine what the health impacts are of e-cigarettes. And, and the biggest problem I have is how many young people use this product and we still, again, we don't understand the impacts of this product. So I think that until the FDA uh, provides the facts and the appropriate regulations of this product, then we should not allow those things to be sold on the market. I'm not suggesting that we don't allow it um, in the future, but we need to understand the health impacts the before F we put it. The FDA has said that cigarettes are terrible for health, but they're they're legal. They're heavily taxed. Yeah, and and the same thing could happen, but we we don't have that information. So um, there there might be some people here from out of town who aren't familiar. Uh, oh, these you. are not San Francisco voters. <laughs> not a fully San Francisco audience, uh, <laughs> but you grew up here in, in in public housing, and and then became the first female African American mayor in the city's history. You're running for re-election uh, in the in the upcoming election. I, I was thinking of asking, you know, who. Who are your coaches? Who are your mentors that kind of have allowed you to ascend uh, to the mayor's office? So, I, I mean, it started with my grandmother. Um, my grandmother passed away in 2016. She raised me. And Ms. Brown was, like, really hardcore. It was like, you do the right thing. You take care of the community. And, you know, it's just what you do. And so I think it started early. And, and part of my upbringing had everything to do with feeling like I was had an obligation because I had an opportunity to go to college and to do some other amazing things. But in the process of going through life, you know, my brother's incarcerated, my sister dies from a drug overdose, I'm going to funerals on a regular basis, I'm losing my friends and my family. And I just felt like, why me? Why only me? And that can't be. And so um, being active, you know, in the community uh, the support came from a lot of people in the community. In terms of political support, I worked as an intern for Mayor Willie Brown. Um, I worked closely with our senator, uh, presidential candidate Kamala Harris. Um, a lot of political folks who um, I volunteer for their campaigns and work with them, not necessarily to run for office, but to try and put forth the kinds of policy uh, decisions that are going to help change the conditions of the communities like communities that I grew up in. And now, um, being in a position like this is absolutely incredible. What, We're already making changes. What's been the most unexpected thing for you about being mayor? The most unexpected thing is how hard it is to go grocery shopping, <laughs> um, to just go into a store and pick something up, um, because I run into people all the time, uh, folks who want photos, folks who want to have a conversation. And, and I appreciate that. And people say, you're doing a good job, Mayor. And then others saying, look, Mayor, we got to talk about what's happening you know, in this particular area. Um, so just moving around the city, being able to just walk around the city like I used to. And um, every now and then, I'll surprise people and just hop on Muni. And they're like, is that the mayor? 
that's the mayor. I'm like sitting down like, no, maybe I'm the mayor's sister or something, you know, trying to fit in. But the hardest thing has really been getting around the city without being recognized. Um, it, it, it's been tough. There, there's been a little bit of a negative national reputation around San Francisco lately. A lot of attention focused on the affordability crisis, on, on homelessness. You know, as you run for re-election, how, how do you start to change some of this? Those are haters. They're just mad and because there, they don't live in San Francisco. And there, well, there are many in the city as well. Who, <laughs> but, but, but I'll tell you, I, I hear you, and I, I, take real, I take offense to that. I mean, like you said, I grew up in public housing. And when anybody in, 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 in where I lived, because my grandmother stayed in the window, and she would yell at people for, you know, dropping stuff on the ground. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Brown. Or, you know, and then she'd proceed to lecture them about how, I don't care if you live in the projects. You don't have to treat them like the projects. This is your home. This is where you live. And so part of you know, what we're doing is, of course, investing millions of dollars in providing more places for people to use the restrooms, the different kinds of trash cans that can't be you know, kind of thrown all over the place, um, um, and, and, and cleaning the streets and power washing. But also, we have to change people's attitude, because the fact is, they're not just homeless people who are littering. Um, again, I walk the streets and I see people who just will throw something on the ground and I will say something. And, and, and it, it, then it becomes a conversation. And hopefully from that conversation, it changes that person's attitude about doing something like that. And so I think cleaning up the streets, helping people into housing, because we know housing, homelessness, mental illness is a real problem. We've gotten over almost 1,500 people off the streets since I've been mayor. Um, we've opened new navigation centers where we have 24-hour shelters so that there's no reason for folks to sleep on the sidewalk in the middle of the day. Um, and, and it's just, it's not a one thing that we're going to be able to do. Mental illness is a real challenge, and we have passed this conservatorship legislation. So this legislation will allow us to force someone into treatment, and people don't like that. We're talking about people who are chronically homeless, mentally ill, and have substance use disorder, who are basically cycling in and out of our jails. Our jails are being used as a mental health facility. And so our legislation will allow us to force someone into treatment. And I know it's not popular with taking away folks' rights, and I totally don't take this lightly, but what are we doing now? They're cycling in in our system. They're not getting the help and the support that they need, and people want us to do something about it. And so I'm taking a, a firm stance to do something responsible about it, in addition to adding another 200 mental health stabilization beds to my most recent $12.3 billion budget. And so putting our money where our mouth is when we provide these kinds of solutions are what's going to get us to a better and place. And there's been some community pushback on some of those navigation centers. But, but do you think the city and, and neighborhoods understand that the, the, the responsibility needs to be evenly distributed? Well, I, I think it depends. I mean, if it's, if it's right next to where you live, you probably won't feel that way. And, and I understand that. Um, but the fact is, we have a crisis. We have thousands of people who are homeless on our streets, not just in San Francisco, but through, throughout the state of California. 24% of the homeless population in the country is right here in the state of California. And so we have to do things differently if we want to really put a dent in this issue. Housing affordability is a part of it, but having places for people to go is also equally important, especially, sadly, people who are mentally ill and have issues with substance use disorder. So what that means is I have a responsibility. I can't do this job in fear of losing it because I'm a native San Franciscan and I want to see a difference. I want to see a change, and so I'm going to propose bold ideas to address the issue because doing the same thing is not going to work if we want to see real changes. I want to leave time for a couple of audience questions, so please start thinking about your questions for Mayor Breed. Uh, but, but one more from me. You know, the Warriors are, are coming home. They're moving to San Francisco next Did you season. say coming home? Can you remind <laughs> Oakland people coming home? They started here in San exactly, Francisco. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But, you know, I don't know how much you think about this, but what are you doing, uh, you know, in, 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 in relation with the, with the team, you know, to make sure there's synergy with the community 
there in Mission Bay, and also so that games are accessible to, to the full population of San Francisco and not just something for our wealthy residents? So, you know, I'm glad you asked that because before the Warriors uh, started their, even their process of coming to San Francisco, their foundation and the work that they were doing, they started to reach out to community-based organizations and to do a lot of great work in San Francisco, uh, rebuilding uh, courts all over the city, providing financial contributions and support to various programs, and also making a commitment to uh, allow uh, local businesses, especially in the southeast sector of the city, to have access to Chase Center where um, they will have their own areas to sell their products and things that they produce right here in San Francisco. So they have already began um, really opening the doors of opportunity to folks here in the city, uh, job fairs and other things in order to get prepared. And ultimately, yes, they um, are committed to making sure that kids all over San Francisco and people have access to, to their games. And so I, I just think they have really started off on the right foot and been a great community partner so far. And I'm really proud of, of what they've done. And I'm also really happy uh, that they're using private money to build you know, Chase Center. And that makes me even more happy. So I, I am confident that they will continue uh, to do the great work they've already started. Okay, questions for Mayor Breed. Yes, sir. With companies like Uber, Lime, Bird, et cetera, how are you guys at City Hall thinking about like urban mobility and the, the, the future city? Like what are the big thoughts on your mind and, and how you're gonna kind of confront that and how the city will change over the next 10 years, et cetera? Yeah, and I think, um, I think one of the challenges we've had in the city in the past is, you know, we've probably reacted to things and then maybe focused on one big thing, like we focused on jobs, 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 and almost kind of ignored housing and transportation when all of these things go hand in hand, especially as we build more units and provide more job opportunities. We gotta get people around the city more efficiently. And so right now I'm in the process of working with, with our uh, MTA department where we have the director. Uh, we're gonna be hiring a new director and I'm hoping for someone who is a proven transportation expert to look at not just how we focus on getting people around on public transportation, but with all these new platforms. How do we make it possible for people uh, with changes to our infrastructure to move around more efficiently on bikes, on scooters, on Muni, and walking, and so on and so forth. And so from my perspective, I mean, just think about it. You see so many people on bikes on Market Street, but at the same time, it's not completely safe. Right, And so we have to make those kinds of changes so that people choose to use other modes of transportation. What I see is a future where you know, people are using scooters and bicycles and um, all the things that really um, help with the environment but also con reduce congestion on our streets. And so making those changes to our infrastructure is gonna be critical to the success of our future. But I'll tell you, it has not been easy. Um, but that's really the future of the city, especially if we're talking about building more housing in other parts of San Francisco. Um, we gotta be creative about uh, getting people around in this city. One more question, yep, right here. Hi, Mayor Breed. Um, I'm from Oakland, born and raised. Um, I did go to San Francisco school in San Francisco and I work in San Francisco in the tech industry. Um, what is your call to action to these players um, as you're talking about some of these issues around housing and you know equity and whatnot what is your call to action to them on how they can better work with city government and technology to help solve some of these issues yeah and I think um, especially with players in particular um, young people are so excited and attracted to them and so I, my call will be to get them more actively engaged in our public school system and making sure that it's, it's not just, I want them to show up one day and there's a big event. It's like the consistency of taking ownership of a middle school or a high school and investing not just your time, but also contributions to those programs. Um, most recently, because we do have real challenges, we continue to have challenges with our underperforming schools where 
Um, a lot of our young people, particularly African-American boys and Latino boys, are not doing as well and have higher dropout rates. And so in my budget, I added additional $10 million to pay teachers more in order to retain them because teacher retention is the biggest challenge we have. And just imagine if one of the, the players um, that you know everyone loves said, okay, this is the school I'm gonna adopt. This is the work I'm gonna do to invest in school. This is how, who I'm gonna raise money for. I'm gonna have conversations with these kids and hold them accountable. I'm gonna lift these teachers up and support them. And just really, it's almost like less of a player and more of a cheerleader for the purposes of inspiring young people um, to be their very best selves in our public education system. I mean, that is, that is one of the things that I'm hoping to get um, folks in the Warriors more actively engaged because uh, it could really make a difference. Well, Mayor Breed, I know you have a busy day uh, actually running this big, complicated city, so thank you for joining us And the us best here city in the world. At Players <laughs> Thank you.